I'm Mark Boris and this is Straight Talk. Tom Tilly, welcome to Straight Talk, mate. Great to meet you, Mark. Thanks for coming in. Uh, we've got your book here, Speaking in Tongues. We're going to hang around that book a little bit. Um, mm. I've got a few things I marked off here and I'm, thanks for signing it. We'll talk about it in a sec, but it's uh, pretty cool. A lot younger Tom there. <laughs> <laughs> I was 23 when that was taken. Yeah, 23. Yeah. yeah it's Luke. amazing. Like uh, you're, you're looking like uh, – you look a bit blotchy around the face there. Like, have you been out that night <laughs> or the night before? I think I am out that night um, doing some late night music demos in Amsterdam, um, writing some music with a friend at the time. So it's meant to connect with the emotional energy of the book, which is a coming of age story. But really, it's just a young bloke on a night out. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. So, like, right, okay, let's, that's 23, right? Yep. I want to talk about Tom Tilly when he was 23. And in order to do that, um, there was a sort of a change in your persona of 23 and that's what comes out in the book that I saw mm. anyway. I want to talk about what happened before that. So who was Tom Tilly prior to that sort of big period in your life at 23? I was a happy little country Christian kid um, born in Dubbo um, to lovely parents, Prue and Andrew, um, who met inside this religious community called the Revival Centre. And it was a, a Pentecostal church that had a point of difference to a lot of the other Pentecostals. So a lot of Pentecostals speak in tongues and we can explain what that is. Yeah, I need to know what that means. Okay, so speaking in tongues is this spiritual practice that's central to most Pentecostals. And basically you speak in this language that no one else can understand that you don't really understand. It's like a free form collection of syllables like any other language. And it's designed to be a way of you connecting directly to God. So instead of having to navigate, you know, the linguistics of known language like English in our case and put together a sentence for what you want to talk to God about or how you're feeling or what you need in your life, you can just freestyle in this unknown language and you almost have a direct soul connect to God. That's the idea of it. So it's sort of like like sometimes you see some of these people in Africa um, and they could like I'm not suggesting this is voodoo mm. but that the voodooism is involved and they get into a, a mental state where they sort of um, get themselves completely psyched up and there maybe they got, there's some help there. They might have some sort of chemical help, I don't know, mm. but they're sort of ra- ranting and raving just like doing circles and shit like that and then just stuff coming out of their head or out of the mouth that doesn't make any sense. Is that what you're talking about? Is it, is it sort of like that? It's got some similarities to that. It's a, it's a little bit like being in a trance, a yep. little bit like being in a meditation and depending on what you believe, um, it's inspired by God or a God-given gift. But um, look. Do you do it in front of everybody? It's It can be done um, in private or in front of everybody. So for us, it was both. We did it in private. We were encouraged to, once we'd received it, which was a real sticking point as a kid. What's that mean, received it? Or There's a moment where you, in the, in the way that we saw it growing up, you could either speak in tongues and that would be a gift that you had that would last for life or you couldn't speak in tongues. It was a real binary, which is a lot, you know, a lot of things in our church were very binary, especially the in-out um, dynamic. And so as a kid... You, you needed to speak in tongues to have salvation. So at some point you needed to receive this gift from God. So from seven, eight, nine years old, you'd be asking for it, praying to God, please give me this gift of speaking in tongues, which represents the Holy Spirit, which is salvation. Whereas our parents, like in the, in the case of my parents, they came along at 25 roughly for mum and about 30 for dad. And they had that experience as adults where they went to this new church that they'd heard about Turned up, walked down the front, got in front of a pastor who put his hands on their shoulders and they opened their heart to Jesus as they told the story and they had this experience of speaking out in this unknown language. So it was a remarkable moment for them but very different when you're told that you have to do it or else you're going to hell and kicked out of your community and then for years sort of yearning for it. How, how do they monitor this stuff like uh – especially for a young kid? Good question. Um, 
you're in these little meetings with other kids, there's groups of you, a pastor will go around or a, or a house leader or an elder of some sort and um, pray with you. And if, if you sort of feel like you're starting to speak in tongues, you've, you're coming out with these new syllables or words and it's, it's happening, you would raise your hand and say, hey, I think I've received the Holy Spirit. I think I'm speaking in tongues. And they would come and have a listen to you and see if it sounded legit and then that was it. Wow. And so if someone of any authority in the church sort of verified your experience, then that was it. You were saved. You were definitely going to heaven, definitely part of the fold. And a lot of those question marks about what would happen otherwise were now gone and you could relax. That's a total wig out, man. Like uh, for a young kid, mm. like uh, how, how old? Like seven, ten, eight, eight, nine. Oh, wow. Yeah. They actually said between seven and ten, for example, that's when you've got to have this revelation. That's when you started going to the children's camps where there are a lot of these prayer meetings or, you know, sometimes on Sundays after the main meeting, that's where um, you'd be encouraged to come to prayer meetings. So, yeah, that just it just gradually started. Like it was this reality that lay ahead of you and you – there's no point you could remember learning about that because it was this omnipresent shared belief amongst the whole community and was constantly spoken about. So, you know, as you get older and – and you gain consciousness of what's going on around you, you sort of slowly realise that that was ahead of you at some point. And that was all good. You expected it would happen, but if time ticked on too far, then you'd start to worry. Then you get nervous, stressed out because you did, you're not going to go to heaven. I mean, how, how many people in this community? Like, what, what's, what size community are we talking about? Um, well, when I was in it, it felt enormous. So... Um, my dad's originally from Adelaide. We would go over to the Adelaide branch where they had about a thousand. Um, drive over from Dubbo across the Hay Plains, drive through the night. Wow. And then we'd go to their camp on the south coast, south of Adelaide, at a place called Karakalinga. You drive in through this dusty road over a little bridge, and then there were these two valleys of tents and caravans full of people. Then you'd all come together at night, and there'd be over a thousand people at this camp on a New Year's Eve. Then you go to Melbourne and there were at least another thousand or so there. And we were in smaller groups in central western New South Wales. So for me, it felt like this, this whole universe, like actually my town and my school felt like kind of small. Like if for my friends that didn't travel as much, I saw their world as smaller than mine because we got to, to travel around and be part of this network. But then in the course of writing the book, I actually looked into it. I was like, well, how many of us were there? You know, and... There were various numbers thrown around by the church, but the most objective number I could find um, was from the census and it was around 4,500 in 1991. So there were probably more than that. I'd say that's an underestimate. I'm, I don't think everyone would have filled out the census properly. Um, so let's just say around about 5,000 when I was 10. Just to get my head around this. So they believe in Jesus. Yep. And like as in a, the, a Christian faith. Yep. And the and the New Testament, I presume. Yep. And... Uh, but they took it fairly literally, I presume. Yeah. And this is run outside of the Pentecostal church but by heads in terms of administration. So compared to um, the Catholic or the Anglican church, the Pentecostal movement's a lot less structured. Um, you know, you don't have to be tied in with the a diocese or this sort of branch structure like a lot of the older religions have. And so... That meant it was also open to people starting new churches quite easily because you didn't have to fit that broader structure. So the Pentecostal movement doesn't have um, those kind of controls. There's lots of people starting different movements and it started in Australia around about the turn of last century, so around about 1900. Um, so there has just been a plethora of groups. Hillsong is the biggest and oh, most that's, famous. That's Pentecostal, right? Yeah, so okay. that's, that's the most successful biggest Pentecostal church, but there are dozens of others. And having written the book, I've done more research about where ours fitted in. And ours was one of the most hardcore, one of the most literal in its interpretation, one of the um, strictest set of rules to live by and the most um, intense focus on speaking in tongues. We were one of very few churches that believed that you had to do it to be saved. For most Pentecostals, Say for Scott Morrison, it's not a must-have for salvation. It's almost like uh, a spiritual bonus to bring you closer to God or, you know, to improve or strengthen or make more direct your relationship with Jesus. So um, 
Scott Morrison's been asked whether he speaks in tongues and apparently he doesn't, but he's still a fully fledged Pentecostal in that movement because he believes in Jesus. Right. So would you call it a cult, the, your version of the, the your sub your sub version of sub Pentecostal? Denomination or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Would well, you call it cultish? The, those the definitions of cult, sect, denomination, uh, they're a little bit contested. Yep. Um, from a few of the sociologists who've researched this space that, that I've spoken to in the course of writing this book, sect feels like a more accurate description, um, partly because cult has been used in so many ways and has pretty dark connotations. Could also be satanic. So, yeah, it's too yeah, broad. Many things. Yeah. It could be a cult film, for example. Um, what sect means is it's a it's a religious group specifically defined by its doctrine. So that fits ours quite well because it was it was all about this interpretation of the Bible that said you had to speak in tongues. That's what set it apart and it was a small group. If it had grown massively, it would one day become a, a formal denomination of its own, but it wasn't at that point, so I call it a sect. For me, if it's a cult, it's sort of damaging. So did you think it was damaging? I'm, you might have a few scars from it, mm. you know, because you had to live a life a certain way. But was it? Is it generally speaking damaging to everybody who is part of it? Because that that would be a cult to me. It can be, and it can be healthy for people. It's got both. Explain and, that. Um, well, some of the great parts about it were having a close community, um, a rich social life, lots of support, people around you that love you. Um, for people who were in big need, who were coming out of um, tough situations like grief or drug addiction, um, they got that human connection they needed. And apart from food, water and shelter, that's one of the most important things you can have. So that was the really positive side of it. Um, the downsides were that because of this strict definition of salvation and therefore membership, there was always the overarching threat that you could be kicked out and not allowed to be in touch with that that world that it offered you so much that's weird so that was it like a judiciary who made a decision okay tom you haven't uh, you know reached your salvation um you're 13 years of age we've sort of carried you for long enough now mate you're out on your own <laughs> was it was it like was it that brutal it, it was on some other behaviors but yep. probably not on like they would give you more time than that. I mean, they would give you as long as you wanted to seek for the Holy Spirit. It would it would have been pretty strange if you were deep into your twenties and you hadn't received. But right. and it would have been unusual in your teens to have not arrived at that point. Um, but they wouldn't have kicked you out for that. But they would kick you out for fornication, sex before marriage. Like right. kicked out forever. What about if you had a Playboy magazine or some like that? That'd probably be a suspension. Right. And so and yeah. what does that mean, suspension? You've got to leave leave the camp or uh, well, we're not living in the camps. Like, you know, we lived in a normal, you know, yeah, lived yeah. on the edge of Maji. It was just, right. we just went to church a lot. We weren't living in a community. But yeah, you could be. Um, so in the story I write about, the first, it took me ages to really start opening up about my doubts about this whole thing. I first questioned it at 10. I didn't voice those, those doubts or those questions till I was 19, 20. So almost 10 years of silence on what was going around in my head. Is this real? Is this legit? Um, and so, yeah, when I did, it got it got pretty tricky, and that's when my world started to kind of really get a bit shake. wobbly. Yeah. Well, let's talk about that. So, like, obviously, so you, you live in Am, you can go to school, normal, usual, you know, one of the state schools, hmm. or Catholic yep, school, whatever, state school, yep. state school, whatever we went to, go off and you get a career in journalism. Yeah, that's sort of what happened to you. Well, yeah, but very, you know, lots of twists and turns in between. What, so, tell me about some of those. Okay, so one of them, um, there's obviously a massive spiritual transformation in this book, but there was also a career transformation. So growing up in high school, I did my work experience at a radio station and two newspapers. But then at the last minute before I had to finalise my uni preferences, I got, I got worried that I wouldn't make enough money in journalism. So I switched to a commerce degree and... I went to Macquarie Uni, did commerce. I was really scared of failing. I didn't have that much conviction about what I was doing, so I had no no plan B. And so I just became – I also got lonely for the first time when I left home and went to uni. That was another factor. And it all led to me just becoming a massive nerd 
So I dug in hard on, on my studies at, at Macquarie Uni and it turned out that I was good at economics. I got straight A's and it got a really, a really good grade point average and ended up getting a job at um, Deutsche Bank. Had an offer at Macquarie Bank, Deutsche Bank, um, Telstra for graduate position. So I went down that pathway. But at the same time as I was hitting these years, I started questioning the church as well. So I was kind of throwing my whole life up in the air. And right before I went from doing sort of two days a week at Deutsche Bank to going full-time at the end of my degree, I went on this trip overseas and traveled backpack through California and Europe. And my mind was just blown. I just met these liberated, amazing people that broke all the rules of the church, but I could tell they were still beautiful, compassionate people. And that's when my mind first opened that there was another way to live. You finished a degree yeah. just before you went to, work, went to work for Deutsche? Full time, full time. yeah. So you're like um, in a gap year at the end of the university sort Just of thing. six weeks. I'm six, like, six weeks, yeah. Yeah. And uh, what did you see though? When you say liberated, do you mean – and no swearing and profanity or, you know, indulging. Well, what, what's that mean? It meant... Um, Fornication? No, that, that actually came much later for me. That was a big kind of red line because that was the only rule that meant you could be permanently excommunicated. Oh, really? But outside of marriage, is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah outside yeah. of marriage, right, yeah. Right. Whereas the rest of the, the rules and the guidelines were sort of temporary um, suspensions yeah yeah so much less serious but permanent exclusion from your community and you know when your whole family's in it your family as well so at that age you're a virgin like at nine. I was a virgin till 23 23 right yeah wow um, there that's, it is. <laughs> that's pretty full on. Uh, I mean, like, yeah. I know you're flashing back to your early years. Yeah, Mark. I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, I won't say how old I was, much younger, much, 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 much younger. But uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, man, that's like, uh, so, okay, so you're, you're traveling around, say, California, yeah. which is, you know, like the fornication, Californication, the fornication capital of the world, one of them. And then you went to Europe as well. Yeah. I'm um, the same deal. Where else in Europe ago? You go? Okay, so what, what happened in Europe that really took things on a turn for me is that I ended up sharing a taxi with this woman into New York and then we ended up on the same flight from New York to London and she said, I live with a bunch of my Spanish friends in London. We're all squatters. Um, we live in um, Camberwell near Brixton. We rave all weekend. Um, oh, my God. By the way... We're driving home to Madrid for Christmas from London. Why don't you jump in the van with us, split the costs, we'll have a fun trip, you know, and I was actually going to Spain anyway. So I just thought, why not? I'm just going to jump in the van with these people. So I jumped in this van with these four wild Spanish squatters in London. I get out of the train station in Brixton, jump in, they're playing basement jacks, where's your head at, it's five in the morning. They start yelling at each other as we hit the edge of town. Someone's left their passport and it was just like this crazy three days. We pull into, it takes us like nine hours to get to Paris. We roll into someone's apartment. The room's full of people smoking joints and hanging out. And I'm like, wow, this is crazy. And I just sort of thought, this is great. These are good people. And, you know, from the external church perspective, these were bad people. They did drugs. They partied. Um you know, lots of things that probably didn't believe in God probably had walked away from God or, you know, weren't, weren't adhering to the religious traditions that they'd grown up with quite, quite evidently. And yeah, but, uh, but they were, they were beautiful, wonderful people. And I initially felt really uptight, but I just slowly kind of let go. And I just had the most amazing time with these people. And then I met other people, another guy who was really loose, but he was, also a Christian. And he said, Tom, it's not about all these rules and who's in or who's out. Like that's, that's what Jesus was fighting back against. Uh, he was out there sort of helping the poor and the weak. He was known for his compassion, you know, forgiveness. Um, that's what Christianity is about. And he was also a rebel. Yeah. He rebelled against the, the administration. Yeah, the scribes and the Pharisees. Yeah, he, he, yeah. and he, he lived out in the bush. Like, you know, he chose not to be part of all this shit yeah. and uh, build his own army. Anti-establishment. But yeah, totally anti-establishment, which everybody tends to forget. And by the way, the establishment now has become, they use Christianity as 
a way of maintaining the establishment. But that's 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 what he was. He was he was rebellious. The way I see it. Mm. One of the best rebel, rebels that ever has been. He didn't do it yeah. through war either, by the way. He mm. did it through um, just by being good. Mm. That, as a history lesson I'm talking about. Yeah. Right? At any stage did this dude who you're talking to, um, did he convince you or inspire you or? Yeah, there was a light bulb moment when I was sitting there talking to him. I'm in this cafe in Barcelona. Um, we've been going out till 5 a.m. for the last five nights on the trot. On it? We on the on no, it? no, no. St- at this stage, it's sort of been pretty good. A tiny bit of alcohol, yeah, um, but no drugs, yeah, yeah. Um, but just going with the flow and just enjoying lots freedom. of energy, lots of energy, yeah. and and not feeling contained. I just thought, no one knows me here. Yeah, yeah. How good. I'd grown up the eldest brother of four in a tight religious community in a country town. Everyone knew me. Yeah, yeah. Where I went, and I actually love that. Yeah, I love that closeness of community. But for the first time, I was like, I can do what I want. And I don't have to, no one else has to know in my world. And I wasn't rebellious enough to kind of really, really, you know, kick it down the road, but just edged out, you know, pushed the boat out a little bit and it just felt so good. But yeah, sitting there with him, I I was able to see this more clearly in writing the book and looking back on what really transformed in my mind that day. And, and what it was, I'd been taught that you had to adhere to the Revival Centre path to salvation and if not you were on the other end of the binary which was eternal damnation you know the lake of fire and brimstone and he painted this different portrait of jesus the the hero of the movement um that showed you could you could live a life driven by compassion um and it could be adventurous and interesting you know through helping other people and i i just thought that's that's actually what the gospels in the Bible are all about. This example of of Jesus and this different perspective that he brought, and it just opened my mind to a third path: fire and brimstone on one side, the strict, you know, narrow is the gate sort of version from the revival center. In the middle was like, I can be a good person outside of the revival center structure and not be in, you know. The lake of fire and brimstone. There's a there's a third path here. There's, a, that, there's another way. And that, that's sort of interesting. You you can be Christian like without having to be a member of anything. When you came back to Australia after this experience, how long did you work in Deutsche Bank? And then at what point did you decide, hang on, I'm I'm, I'm off to journalism? So there were the kind of dueling narratives. Um, when I got back, the church, the dynamic between myself and the church started to blow up big time. So you went back home? Back home. Yeah. Um, start the job full time. Wish I was still in Europe, you know, living the free life. Um, but got this job, had borrowed a few grand off my parents for the trip, needed to pay them back. Also still a fairly conscientious kid, not wanting to throw away an opportunity at a, at a big bank. So drag myself back to work full time. Things start blowing up with the church. And so in this book, there's three acts of my story. The first act goes from naught to 18. No, sorry, naught to 20. Um, the second act focuses on what we're talking about now, which is the next two to three years. This is where all the transformation happened, like between 20 to 23, 24. And then the last third of the book um, spans, you know, almost 20 years since then. And so I really zone in on these years where things started to hurt, you know, running into trouble with the church, seeing a different way, but realizing that that following this new vision probably meant cutting myself off from my community, including my immediate family. Um, then at the same time that's happening, the job at the bank was not working for me. I was in not the most exciting part of the business. So I had, you know, graduate friends in all different parts of, of the bank from mergers and acquisitions to trading. I was in the asset management business in the sort of marketing and sales zone. You know, I wasn't at the center of the business. Yeah. I, I sort of realized I'm a support service. It wasn't that exciting. I actually went for a job, job in the trading team and interviewed all the way through um, Hong Kong, Tokyo, up to London, then just missed out. The asset trading? The um, stuff it, they hold on the balance sheet? It was going to be... Um, it was going to be trading over in the bank side um, 
stock lending, basically. Right, stock lending. Okay, yeah. Yep. Um, just missed out on that. It's like, right. And then my brother was like, I'm going to Africa. I'll see you later. I'm going on a three-month trip. He's a year and a half younger. He's a big character in my story, my brother Sam, because we're so close in age. And I'd also met this amazing girl on this trip to Europe and we were wanting to give a relationship a go. She was from the Netherlands. So after two years, I quit the job at Deutsche Bank. Um, there'd been so much going on with the church. Um, and then I moved over there and just basically had a proper gap year. Travelled through Africa with my brother for three months, lived in Amsterdam for the rest of that year. With the girl? Yeah. You like lived together? We lived together. That, that's a big no-no. That's right. So, Do you have to go and fess up? I mean, do you, what did you do? So by this time I was I was out and there's a lot of like intense moments. What does that, that mean out? out? What do you mean out? So... Look, a lot of the a lot of the details in there, but essentially, I left once. Um, I got kicked out for going to the Mardi Gras. Crazy moment in my life. They found out about it, or you told they them. They found out. Was it on Facebook or something? Not sure how they found out. Potentially, my brother just blabbed, and then someone had to pass it on to them. But at the end of a Sunday meeting, they're like, um, "Could Sam Tilly and Tom Tilly please uh, meet us in the side room after the service?" Oh wow! So we roll into that room. And they're like, we have reason to believe you've attended the Sydney Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras. <laughs> Why did you attend it? Just for just for just to have a geek? Just for the fun of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'd just been to Europe and yeah. you know, been in the streets of Lona on New Year's Eve and felt this energy and passion. And I think I thought that, that that was all in Europe. And then I got back home and someone said, Oh, the Mardi Gras on this weekend. Should we go? I'm like, maybe that's some some of that same energy's here, you know? unbridled expression of freedom and connection and community so yeah we just went down we thought oh probably no one will find out we'll just let's just do it so my brother and i had this huge night out we end up dancing in the rain in taylor square after all the you know the djs and the speakers have been shut down it was just a drumming circle in taylor square we're in there with hundreds of people in the rain dancing and it's like this is good Cut to next Sunday, we're in the side room face to face with the passers um, being called out. And at that point, I was like, yeah, we were we were at the Mardi Gras. Like, well, you know, we can't condone that. Like, yeah, we know. What and, are you gonna do about it? Yeah, totally. They're like, well, we're gonna have to put you out of fellowship. And in my mind, I was like, yes. I don't know if you've ever been broken up with Mark where you actually wanted to break up with the person but you were too gutless to do it. No. And then when they do it to you, you're yeah. like, thank God. <laughs> <It Literally>. was, <laughs> yeah. In this case, it was a bit like that. Thanks. So I, I walked down and went, yeah, this is, you know what? This is good and it, it's an easier out for me. It's much easier than me going to my parents and saying, hey, mum and dad, I'm not sure if I believe in this whole thing. Like that would be a very, that would have been a very hard thing for me to say. But what was easier for me to say was, these pastors here in Sydney are a bit intense. They've just kicked me out for the Mardi Gras. Oh, this is in Sydney. It wasn't back home. I'd moved to Sydney by yeah. then, so yeah. Oh, but so you're seeing the Sydney version of what? The Sydney version home. was much stricter. Right. And my dad wasn't the pastor. See, right. Mudgy, my dad was the pastor. Yeah, yeah. And he gave me actually having the, being the pastor's son gave me more freedom rather than less. But when I got to Sydney, the net closed in a bit, and I started to to run into more trouble. How, how did you tell you when you told your folks? I mean, mm. were you did you feel a bit mortified, a bit uh, like you're going to disappoint them? How, or how yeah. did they receive that? My brother burst into tears. He's like, "What are we going to tell mum and dad?" And just just lost it. Where by that point, I was I was ready to make a break, and this this initially was an easy way for me to do that. So I said, "I'm not going to come back." They think they're suspending me, but I'm walking. But then after a few months, they'd already dragged my brother back in. Um, he wasn't quite on the same journey yet as I was. And then I was out of my own. And, um, yeah, there was this very intense moment that I go into big detail about where I, in hindsight, I was manipulated into coming back. At the time, I felt like this guy got me with a fairly good argument. His argument was, do you know how much hurt you're going to cause all your family and friends and community by leaving when you've never really given it 100%? 
And I said, hang on a minute. I've given my whole life to this. What do you mean I haven't given it 100%? He's like, have you, have you really given it everything? And I, I, I played by the rules of his interrogation. And I thought, well, strictly speaking, I guess I haven't given it everything, you know, like there's times where I just do things for me, you know, there's times where I just go out and have fun or there's times where I, um, you know, maybe I tell a small lie to myself or I'm slightly indulgent. Yeah, I guess I, like strictly speaking, I haven't given it 100%. Well, why would you do that to all your friends and family if you've never given it 100%? And I couldn't. Hard argument to beat. I couldn't break that argument if, if I stayed within the confines of that logic, which yep. I did at that point. And so, yeah, that was a real... That's a, that was a really emotional point for me is going against my own will. Like I wanted to be out. That felt right. It, it corresponded with all these intense feelings I'd had traveling and responding to the situation I was in. But I, I couldn't break his logic. So I, I went back and gave it another go. And how long for? About three or four months. And then the European girlfriend came out to visit, stayed in our house for two nights. Which, not your parents' house? No, my share house yep. full of other Christians. And, um, yeah, then that was against the rules. But she, would, I'd organise this is so embarrassing and clunky and there's all these rules and policies and I'd organise for her to stay somewhere else but she needed two nights when she first arrived at our house. Like, surely that's surely a bit of grace. That would be fine. But she that, didn't stay with you. She stayed no, like in your bed, not in my bed, but if we're getting room. down to it. Yeah. yeah. In your room. Yeah. In my room. So, I mean, it's so ridiculous that you even have to come down to these micro definitions. Yeah. We're talking about a, a 21 year old. Yeah. yeah. You know, two 21 year olds. Yeah, yeah, totally. Is it, this is, this is the, this is the girl from Netherlands. Yeah. Yeah. So you obviously had a crush on her. Like, yeah, we, no, we were hanging we, out. We together. started a long term, a long distance sort of relationship. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. that's what brought me unstuck with the church the second time around. And so I was trying to bring – I was going to bring her to the church the next day. Well, you mean to, to do what? To, to, to try and get, get her, her part, involved. To get her to be part of it? Yeah. Was she, was she open to that? She was a little bit open to that. Yeah. Yeah, but I guess the people from, you know, the Dutch – she's Dutch. Yeah. She's from Netherlands, but she's Dutch, I assume. But, so, but they're usually fairly open-minded. You know, they'll give most, most things a crack, I guess, because that's my experience with people from the yeah. Netherlands. I mean, I've, had, I've done a bit of work over there for, for over the years. But they're also pretty smart, yeah, and they're very practical, and very logical. I think they would they'd, they'd be open to it because they would trust their own logic to analyze the situation yeah. once they are in there and back themselves to step away if they needed to. So they wouldn't be worried about getting drawn can, into it. Can I just draw you to one page? Yeah, <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if this is the event. Um, at three a.m., I woke with a raging erection. <laughs> I love the honesty. I actually do. I really like the honesty. And and, and everybody at 23 or one of that age group has mm. probably experienced something similar. Um, and at this stage you're a virgin, right? Mm -hmm. And I mean literally raging. My penis was angry. <laughs> and my skinny 20-year-old frame pushed up against Anna's curves. My mind and body were all at war. All my instincts were telling me to have sex with this woman while my thoughts were telling me such a move would ruin my life, ruin my life. Mm. That left my poor penis paying the price in this brutal conflict. Is that is that, that night? No. Or that's another night. No, that was on the trip in Europe. And but that, that, that's the trip in Europe was pr prior to this. Yeah. Prior getting, to that, that night when she came to Australia and she stayed yeah. in the shared house. Yeah. How did you resist those like natural instincts, so they're natural instincts of a 20 year old or probably even a 16 year old. But how did you resist those natural instincts? I mean, like you said, you're at war with yourself, like, uh, because that must be amazing conflict, yeah. Because if I'd crossed the line, I would have felt so much guilt about it because of all the meaning that had been attached to those actions and my, my knowledge of the rules and their consequences that I couldn't have lived with that guilt. And being happy, I would have had to tell them, and then why do you have to why do you have to tell them? Because of the guilt. Yep. So if you tell them, the guilt goes. Is that is that how it works? So you can, you can sort of get forgiveness, so to speak. It's like going to confession. It's a great question. Um, 
the guilt would go, but you'd probably be facing a different kind of pain. Um, There'd be punishment you, associated with it. Yeah, that. exactly. You'd feel the pain from the punishment. You'd feel the sh- the guilt would probably turn to shame. Yeah, so they would shame you. You would be ashamed because everyone would find out that you left the church or were put out or even just suspended for crossing the line. Explain to me the intense trade-off in your brain. <laughs> a young, you're being a, effectively a young man. Mm. You are a young person and you're probably not all that exposed to society to some extent. Yeah, I mean, relatively uni, sheltered. Yeah. Relatively sheltered in in a certain sense. Like you weren't like me growing up in punch bowl. Like, you know, I spent my life seeing this shit all the time, you know. The conflict in your brain must be intense. Like I can't do it because I'm going to suffer guilt and if I suffer guilt, then one way to fix that is I've got to go and tell them. Then everyone, all my family is going to out me and they're all going to be embarrassed. My family's going to be embarrassed mm. potentially. Yep. So it's not worth it. Um, I'm just going to let that fella just down there um, just, uh, you know, stand at ease and, uh, <laughs> and wait for the next occasion or I'll wait until the day I get married. They don't call this straight talk for nothing, do they? No. Nah. <laughs> That's what we're doing it for. Yeah. Because, I mean, I'm intrigued, absolutely so intrigued. What? Yeah, it's, it's a great point. So what you're trading off is this short-term visceral physical moment of but you potential don't pleasure. Term. I mean, your brain, the neurology, Tom, the, the yeah. neurologically. I guess there was Your a- brain turns off. All logic disappears, R- rationality. When a guy has got a hard on and he's got the opportunity and it's available, I'm assuming it's, you know, it, was, it was on, and let's say there it was, you know, confidential, so to speak, it was discreet, um, all your your brain just shuts down, your logic shuts down and it, and uh, one thing takes over. I guess my logic. That? I guess my logic didn't shut. Didn't down. shut down. So that no. that's a, a lifetime of um of um neurological um conditioning. That's a lifetime of conditioning. So somehow you've conditioned your brain to override your instinct, like which is pretty. It's, that's full on. That's pretty strong. Yeah, I mean, it was. It, it wasn't that hard though. Like these, yeah, these rules were fairly hard programmed and the consequences were so clear, you know, these big long-term um, consequences and shame and the pain that would come with that was was so obvious to me that it, it wasn't that hard for me to… Because you're programmed. Yeah, I guess so. And that, that's getting, I don't want to make, I'm not here to judge your life, but that's mm. getting cultish for me because it is programming um, f- manipulation mm. might be another word, but programming. So yeah. Manipulation program the same thing. Programming someone for an outcome. I guess programming, yeah, it's, it depends on the definition of it. So programming to me sort of implies that there's a, a set of logic that you maybe don't quite understand properly that allows you to follow a process that's not necessarily of your own volition. Yep. Um, look, in my mind at that point, there was just a very clear trade-off you know, this this deep pain and getting cut off from my community and potential shame versus a moment of pleasure. And I could see that trade-off for what it was. But, yes, that that trade-off had been constructed by the rules but of the church. But that's very logical what you said. I mean, what you just said to me then, Thomas, yeah. really logical, right? Yeah. If you say it to me like that, makes sense. Yeah. I, I get it, right? Yeah. But my, what I'm trying to say is um, – you are so well programmed at the time. You were so well programmed. You were so well neurologically conditioned that you could have that logical mm. conversation with yourself. Yeah. Um, but an, an, oh, I was going to say normal person, but another yeah. person who hasn't been through this conditioning, they're, they're not going to uh, employ the logic because yeah. they haven't been neurologically conditioned. The logical steps haven't been built in their mind. They haven't mind. been built in. So what you're getting a sense of that, I was someone that liked to be in control and act rationally. And what that meant was I didn't take these giant leaps away from where I was at any particular point. My, And this is what I've learned about myself through writing this story is, is the way I approach all situations. I am like passionate and wildly optimistic, full of energy, but there's a careful – calculated element and so the reason I couldn't jump off the cliff and dive in at that moment 
was I knew I couldn't just break away from that community and stay happy, that I would, I would fall apart. And this was the trade-off as I worked through these different scenarios where I was faced with a choice between following what I was realizing was, was my truth, which was different from the church's truth, but trying to navigate between the two. I did it step by step. So the first step was seeing a third pathway, breaking the binary, hell and damnation versus the revival sent away. There's another way I can be a good person and a Christian outside of that. That's the first step. Then go through all these ups and downs, leaving, drawn back in, leaving again. Then it's like, well, I still want to be a Christian because then I can, I'm not throwing the whole thing out. Then I've got a story to tell my family that I'm still going for the moral high ground. I'm not leaving to become, you know, a uh, a fornicating headedness. I'm going because I think there's a there's a better way to do Christianity. So that allowed me a wiggle room, you know, one step away, but not too far, and still retaining sort of dignity and respect to my family. Argue, fight with the church, eventually leave ours. Then I go on search, on a search through a bunch of other churches. That's when I step out into the broader Pentecostal movement. All right. Let's see how other people are doing it. Maybe there's another community I can be a part of that has the balance right, that has like the view of Jesus that's that's compassionate and exciting, not sort of damning and, and binary as he'd been portrayed in our church. And so well, I work- I say not I would I don't want to interrupt you there, but yeah. I'd say betrayed. Because mm. Jesus should not be portrayed as binary. Mm. And that's a betrayal of who the dude was. I agree. And I'm not talking religious stuff. I'm just talking what I've, I've read the New Testament mm. probably 20, 30 times, wow. Matthew, Mark, yeah. Luke, not John so much, but those three, just to learn about it. Mm. And that's not what I get from it. Yeah, and that's what I was learning as well, but I'd only sort of seen it from that perspective growing up. So, yeah, anyway, I, I then found went to another church which was more like a Hillsong church, C3, on the Northern Beaches. I even went to another church in London. I went to a church in Costa Rica when I was over there. I started searching out the Christian world. And there were things about the broader Pentecostal movement that also didn't sit right with me. Um, One, I felt a little bit uncomfortable about how much focus was put on money. Um, I also felt that a lot of the focus was put on these sort of emotional experiences and bringing new people into this mega church, but I wasn't sensing there was this ongoing, deeper nourishment for ongoing members. Anyway, I eventually, yeah, find this um, this church, and it's actually just the youth arm of the local Anglican church in Manly, down on the Corso, St. Matthew's. And I never would have considered going to a standard church. We believe that they'd sort of lost their way. That's what we were taught growing up. But I went in there and it it didn't have all this fanfare that kind of concerned me about the wider Pentecostal movement. Um, the other thing about the Pentecostal movement, it felt like they just lived in their own bubble and they weren't connecting with the community around them and doing good works of charity. Whereas these, these young Anglicans, they had a, a Christian surfers group, they were all engaged in in the manly community. They weren't sort of living in their own sort of um, bubble. And um, so what I felt like, I, I took these just one step at a time, finally boiled things down and that was kind of my process. Um, and then there was a big twist when I got, I, I thought I found the perfect church, all the things that I thought a church should be, the, the right view of the Gospels. Um, enough grace and leeway for members to run their own lives, real connection to community. And um, ultimately I realised once I'd boiled it down to its purest form that I didn't believe it. I didn't, I didn't buy it. I didn't buy the story that God created the world in seven days. I didn't, I didn't really, when it, when it came down to it, I didn't believe that Jesus was the son of the God almighty and came down to rescue us from our own sin. Who gave us the sin? Oh, God programmed us to sin in the first place. I just thought it just doesn't 
makes sense. Yeah, it doesn't pass muster. But then the last step of this whole step-by-step process was my virginity. And so because the rules meant that 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 would be a permanent launching off point for me, my family is still all in the church at this point, launching off point from my religious community, never can come back, can never be the prodigal son, um, cuts me adrift from my family in some ways. That took me another two years. So that gives you a sense of the kind of person I was and what my process was. It really was one step at a time and I needed absolute clarity because through all these ups and downs, I hit some real low points where I felt so lonely and so unsure of what my future was. I couldn't see it. Was I going to just move overseas and turn my back on my whole childhood or was I going to stay with the church or was I going to find another version? Like I, I was lost and I couldn't see it and it was really hard and I was doing it without the support of my family. Um, we were still in contact but they didn't back my decisions. And so I had to look after my own well-being and just take these small steps to find my way. Like the too big a step and I would have fallen over. Sounds like the church, oh, you know. They fucked you up a lot, but they didn't mean to. I mean, I, I don't think it, mm. that they that was purposeful, but the whole process fucked you up. I mean, and even put yourself in a position where you, your your family feels like they have their hands tied as well. Who they would probably be desperate to help you. I mean, but they felt as though they probably couldn't. Well, they felt it. My dad um, had a more liberal view. You know, he was one of the sort of you know. You take the the liberal party for example. You've got the the moderates, and then you've got the yep. sort of the the harder right and so my dad was very much in the moderate faction of the revival centers and he but he, his view was let's change it from the inside you know it's not nothing's perfect you know um but there's a lot of good here let's not throw it all away and that was where we sort of differed so we weren't on other sides of the universe um, but we had different ways of dealing with it and what age were you when you landed on something that was sustainable mm. So after two years of real struggle with the church, um, I definitely left, left Christianity, left the job at Deutsche Bank and that's when I had that year overseas, um, mostly in Amsterdam and that's where I just got a chance to break away from the expectations and had you know kind of a classic gap year where I just gave myself carte blanche to just explore my passions. So in Amsterdam I started writing what ended up the length of a book about my travels in Africa. I started going to these blues sessions playing guitar and jamming. Um, I did a, a course um, in editing video. Um, I started working on films and I just started like I was a part-time model in Europe, um, which was what paid the bills back in those days. And so I just I did a lot of sleeping in. I would go and play just basketball down the street. You know, I just – saw where my passions would kind of land. Um, I ended up doing a weekly radio show on an old pirate radio station. So I'm in this like deep in this abandoned building in Amsterdam in an old bank vault where they've set up this mixing desk and a little radio station. That's pretty cool. It was pretty cool, yeah. I was like, this is awesome. This feels good, you know. I was just feeling my way. And then after a year of that, that's when I came back to Australia and started my new life. I was going to live in Adelaide where my parents were, but I just couldn't find any job opportunities there. So I ended up by chance running into a few friends and landed in Darlington, Redfern, inner city Sydney, and met all these activists really passionate about um, Indigenous issues. Went on this crazy freedom ride trip, the 40-year anniversary, went to all these Indigenous communities, and that was a big passion of my father's that he sort of instilled in us. And so I just sort of connected on on passion with new people and moved into a share house, Abercrombie Street, downtown, you know, Darlington, Redfern and started fresh, age 24. And that's where I began my new life. And how would you get into, I mean, all the young people here are all under 30, uh, all talk about the Triple J hack, <laughs> you know, the show yeah. you're on. How would you get onto that? So initially I was aiming at um, documentary making. Well, that'll get me traveling out meeting with people you know you've got more creativity in these long form kind of stories and get paid perfect ideally get paid but yeah. so many documentaries are passion projects where people don't get paid a lot so 
Um, I then ended up with some part-time, I was on the dole for six months, kind of really struggled career-wise. And as someone who'd had a good GPA and got offers at investment banks, being on the dole was pretty tough and eventually cut off from the dole. <laughs> so, but, it's a sort of, but also it's, uh, it's empowering too. It empowered the amount of time I got to go surfing. And also to think and, and to create. Think. Well, what I, what I actually did, I'm sort of joking about, you know, being on the Johnny Howard surf team at the time, but I, I actually went and did an internship for 50 bucks a day helping an independent filmmaker and just did his office stuff, you know, just sort of learn about how productions come together and that kind of thing, which then led on to the next thing and the next thing. And then I eventually end up with some part-time work in the ABC newsroom and I'm like, news, you can have a full-time job and tell important stories. I'm going to hit this for a while and then potentially the longer form or creative stuff will come further down the track. And then I was in there and then the sort of the idea of doing something in radio came back and then a job came up at Triple J and I'd had just enough experience in the newsroom, done some postgrad study across the road at UTS, got some of my assignments published in the Sydney Morning Herald and on Radio National and just scraped into my first gig at Triple J um, and I was 27. So kind of a late starter for my first time journalism gig, but absolutely in my element. First first job, flying to Darwin, drive out towards Kakadu, stories about pig hunting and football teams and Harley Davidson's inside the main bar of the local pub. And I'm just like crossing in live to – Miff J and the Doctor, who were, you know, these were massive celebrities to me. I was a country kid, you know. I'd listened to these people on the radio, gone to, I'd gone, actually, I didn't even go to, Jay and Lindsay had a band, Friends or Ron. I thought it was called Friends of Ron. That's how out of touch I was. So these people were superstars to me. And so, yeah, suddenly I ended up with the dream gig. And then I just got in there and my skills weren't great to start with, but I just sort of, that's where I cut my teeth. How long did you do it for? I was a reporter for a um, bit over four years. And then gradually I got better at it, also developed a vision for what our show could be as well as reporting out in the field. I would sit in the production booth every night next to the executive producer and I would take all the talk back calls. So, g'day, what's your name? What do you want to say? This is Triple J. And so I would pick up maybe 50 callers in an hour, in half an hour. Yeah, so I got to know the audience firsthand. I hear the tone of their voices. Mm. I can hear what's making them call. I can hear what issues matter to them, how they feel about it. Um, and the language I use and the speed at which they speak and the energy behind it, if yep. they really believed it or if they didn't believe it. Yeah, whether they were punking us, why their sense of humour yeah. kind of cut in, all that kind of stuff. So I developed a sense of the audience and also a vision for how the show could be. Back then it was sort of, this is getting a little bit deep into sort of radio format, but I became, I really nerded out on this. Um, it was host introduction story about such and such from reporter i was like i think we need more and then they would do that four or five times throughout the show four or five stories i was like let's get a one really strong issue and we'll do a story about it and then we'll interview a psychologist to pick it apart and then we'll take some calls and like i was really into building this longer linear form of of storytelling that drove interaction from our listeners and this is when it you know the text line became much more of a thing. Social media was just starting. We Did were it really get you in trouble? Yeah, I got in trouble a few times. Well, writing this book, you've now got a podcast. Mm. What's your podcast called? The Briefing. It's just a quick 20-minute hit of what's happening in the world. Is it a form of liberalism though? Like are you employing a freedom of speech? Um, well, it's not a simple binary freedom of speech. Like we have defamation laws, we have yep. trade practices act. There actually are all these, um, restrictions and considerations around, um, not just the legalities, but also consequences of free speech. So it's never a binary, you know, mm. never, never was probably never will be, even though people try and define it as a freedom of speech or not. So yeah, we weigh up all those considerations, always striving to give people as much quality information as they as they can get to try and understand the world around them you know that's the goal with it is to help people understand the world around them and make more informed decisions in their life inside that world that's that's how i see journalism you take the view that journalism at least in what the way you do it is 
helping people understand what is what it is that's going on in the world around them, so they can help help them understand how better to run their lives or how be, how to get a better life. That's my editorial framework, and that sort of came from Triple J, where we were focusing on a younger audience, and I was thinking, what do they want to hear in the afternoon, and and why do they want to hear it, and the why was important, and I believe it's to live a better life, you know. The more you can understand about the world, the better quality decisions you can make, the more fulfilling existence you can have. Brilliant insight. Thanks very much. Tom Tilly, your speaking in tongues is a real worthwhile read and I really Thanks, appreciate Mark. your honesty, not only in the book, but today. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks for man. having me on. <laughs>